Orcs, the lovable green goofballs of the grim dark future. They can be found from one end of the galaxy to the other. If there is violence happening, you best believe if an orc didn't start it, they are en route. And yet, when one thinks of the greatest threats to humanity in the 41st millennium, they seem to fall a little short. When compared to the god-powered hyper-technology of the Necron, the limitless evolving swarm of the Tyranid, the insidious machinations and brutal legions of chaos, it becomes so easy to dismiss the Orc. And why not? Orcs may have mighty, if ramshackle, machines of war. They might have the numbers, the durability, even the cunning and inventiveness to stand shoulder to shoulder with the other mighty threats of the galaxy. But, as we all know, they lack the foresight, the imagination, and the drive to truly threaten the Imperium. Give an orc a good fight, some shiny loot, and he's happy. Take those things away from him, and he will fight other orcs until they are available once more. Simple, short-sighted, fearless, content. Gazgul is none of these things. Trust the sons of the lion to make ammunition so poor it turns foot soldiers into conquerors. While nothing in particular marked the birth of the most important orc possibly of all time, it was, however, extremely on brand. Gazgal's first act was to kill something. His questing arm desperately trying to find some sort of purchase to pull his adult human-sized newborn body out of the hole in the ground which had gestated the spore he grew from. Perhaps had a wild squig not come to investigate what it hoped was a free meal, billions of lives would have been spared. But investigate it did, and Gazgul's questing arm grabbed a hold of the beast's lolling tongue and tore its internal organs out by the appendage. While this didn't give the newborn orc the leverage it had hoped for, the steaming pile of blood and internal fluid softened the frozen ground just enough for the orc that would become Gazgul to force his way to the surface. The world that greeted the young orc was cold, barren and sparsely populated. It was a world that had been in orc hands so long that they had been reduced to grubbing in the dirt and fighting each other over scraps of long looted hive cities. There just wasn't much left and no one else to fight. By any standards, even Greenskin, it was a sad little backwater. They called it Urk. Orcs are born with knowledge of how to talk, walk and fight, along with a bunch of other information besides. However, it was joining the local Goth tribe that first introduced young Gazgul to Orc culture and perhaps more importantly, to Orcish religion. In between fighting and drinking, and, well, fighting and drinking, the Goths taught him about Gork and Mork, reincarnation, and the Orcish place in the universe. Young Gazgul was inspired by this information. So inspired, in fact, he convinced the local boss to launch a raid on a nearby Dark Angel observation post. Turns out it was an unmanned post, and while the Orcs didn't get the battle they wanted, they did get shot to pieces by the structure's automated defences. Gazgul was one of the first to fall, a bolt round detonating inside his skull. The explosive round destroyed half of his cranium and most of his brain. The young Orc collapsed to the ground. Suddenly, he didn't know who he was, where he was, what he was doing, why he was dying. Even the information an orc is born knowing had been stolen away by the fire and shrapnel of the weapon. Knowledge of the gods alone remained. What happened next is open for some debate. There are many versions of the tale. What we do know for sure 
is the surviving orcs destroyed the automated dispensers and left in disappointment. At some point a few days later, the heavily wounded Gazgull appeared at Rust Spike, a tribe Death Skull settlement hundreds of miles away. More specifically, he appeared at the entrance to the surgery of Mad Doc Grotsnik. Whether he got there by holding in his remaining brains with one hand while fighting off wildlife, or was dragged there by the Goths since everyone knew Grotznik was paying for dying but still alive boys to experiment on, or something in between, depends very much on who you ask. Either way, it was an impressive feat of endurance, as the young orc simply refused to die. It was like the knowledge of how had fled with the rest of his memories. Operate! Operate! Still time to operate! Talented, cheap, and quite insane, Mad Doc Grotznik had established himself as the premier doc in Rust Spike after installing a new bionic eye in the local Death Skull warboss, Dregmech and receiving the glowing review of, I suppose it's an eye. Always excited to have a still alive test subject to work on, Grotznik di did or didn't pay the goffs and got right to work. This orc boy was unusual. He could tell right away. To still be breathing, to still be holding a hand to his head keeping what little brain matter remained from leaking out, with such horrific injury, even by the ridiculously hardy standards of the orc species. This was special. This was the orc Grotznik had been waiting for. Yelling at his Grot assistant, the doc sent for a special piece of scrap he'd been saving for a special orc. A piece of metal supposedly taken from a suit of human Terminator armor. What had once protected a Space Marine veteran's rear end would hold Gazgull's head together. Of course, that didn't solve the issue of the missing brain matter, and there was a lot of it missing. Fortunately, Grotznik was prepared for such an eventuality. Never one to let good product go to waste, Grotznik had kept all sorts of orc parts from his patients that didn't survive. As that was most of them, he had an impressive inventory. The Doc crammed all sorts of brain matter from dead orcs into the future Warlord's skull, stitching brain to brain. It is said Gazgull's remaining brain matter was able to absorb and conquer the other pieces, but we cannot truly know what effect this had on Gazgull's mind. Surely it cannot be overstated. Still, somehow, Gazgull survived and even stabilised. After hours of furious slapdash surgery, Grotznik had done it. He had saved his latest subject. Improved even, as the young orc now had a skull like a battle tank, and a state-of-the-art-ish bionic eye. And since the subject was already unconscious and already on his operating table, Grotznik figured, why stop there? Let's make this orc even better. Replace a joint here, run a cable there. This was a hardy orc, a special case. One Grotznik could truly make a monster out of. Gazgul died just after Grotznik replaced his knee, bleeding out due to sloppy work, or perhaps simply reaching his limit. But it was clear to the doc and his Grot orderlies that the orc boy was done. Disappointed, but hardly surprised, Grotznik dumped him on the failure pile out back and left his lowest ranked grot to pry off the bionics for Lady We's gonna stomp the universe flat and kill anything that fights back. We're the orcs and we're made to fight and win. Spiteful, cunning, cruel and cowardly, the doc's assistant was in every way a typical grot, enslaved to its orc overlords. The little goblin-like creature's sole possessions were two sheets of metal it slept under, and a metal stick used for prying things off Grotznik's former patients. It didn't even have a name. That, along with oh so much, was just about to change. 
giving the body a few precautionary kicks, the grot got to work. Hopping onto the orc's chest, he thought to start with the skull plate, as he could dig his stick into the gaps where flesh met adamantium. The moment the grot's tool touched the metal of Gazgul's head, a surge of energy ran up the stick into the grot, and the two became strangely bonded. As though this single touch had started a chemical reaction, the orc began to move, grunting and spasming, its green limbs flailing about, followed by muscle locks so fierce the grot thought the orc was going to snap in half. Eventually, however, the seizure ended and the orc awoke. Gazgul lived once more, or perhaps for the first time, as there are no records of what he called himself prior to having his brain dramatically altered. His one biological eye glowed brightly with green energy, so dazzling it eclipsed the grot's whole world. It was nothing to start with. Just dark and damp and cold. And then, way up above, there was a voice. Voices, in fact. They were so big and so deep, it was hard to tell what language they were speaking let alone what they said. But it must have been Gork and Mork. And they were fighting, which is fine, because that's what they like doing best. I couldn't see it, but I could feel it. Massive, rumbling impacts that made the dark thunder that would have knocked me off my feet if I hadn't had any kind of presence. And then a spark, a tiny little mode of green bright and hungry, drifting down through many, many, many tusk lengths till it touched the floor of where I was. The green spread out from the tiny point, rippling in big, bright circles and pulling in spots that spread circles of their own. It spread faster and faster until everything was covered in it, as far as I could see. Now it was lit up. I could see I was in some kind of cavern, or rather, a big twisting mess of caverns, like the cells in a hive of sugar gits, but massive. The walls were meaty, I reckon is the word, damp and red and crinkly, like the folds in a brain, which I'd seen enough of in my brief life to know well enough. As the green gathered on them, they changed. They started sprouting fungus, molds and slimes at first. The sort of stuff you would eat when there's a dust storm. And the orcs have had all the good grub. But then murkworts and bile caps and huge complicated things like nothing that grew on Urk. And just like it is outside of Holy Visions, whenever the fungus grew, so did the other green things. Squiglets first, the kind so small you can only see them as mean little specks digging into your armpits. Then squigs as big as talon tips and fists and heads. Next came snotlings, who are to grots what we are to orcs. Crawling and yipping and scrapping with each other in big, writhing piles. Everywhere there were snotlings eating squigs, and squigs eating snotlings. And with every jaw snap, gnash and gnaw, the green grew brighter and more alive. Then there were grots, swarms of grots. And they got straight to work, lashing together meager little tools from squig sinew and cap wood and bullying the snots into working, too. Faster than I could keep up with. They beat the fungal jungle back and started building farms and drops and brew huts and barracks. They were just in time for the first orcs who were crawling their way out of their grow holes now and were hungry already. The orcs kept coming and they kept getting bigger until even the runts among them were as big as the war bosses on Urk. And above it all, way up, on what might have been the cavern roof or might have been infinity, 
The stars were coming out. More stars than every mech on Earth could have counted in a lifetime. And every one of them. Bright, angry, beautiful green. I was so distracted by the stars, I didn't even see the squig off. It was a brilliant thing, a horrible thing. As big as a battle wagon it was, and it made the skinny, sad-throated beast raised by Urk snakebite herders look pathetic. It nearly smashed me to mush with its foot, but I didn't live to three years old by not being able to roll out of the way of a stomp Mork snickered fast. And once I was on my feet, I followed the beast. I don't know why, but it felt right. Soon there was a whole herd of squigoths lumbering along at something like a gallop and barging each other with enough force to flatten forts. I ran along with them through the untamed garden, and I didn't care if they stamped me flat because it felt like fear wasn't something worth feeling in this place. Up above now, where the green stars shone, there were warriors, huge orcs, perfect orcs, everyone bigger than a clan chief and rippling with green light. I don't know how I knew, but they were orcs as they were meant to be. They glowed bright enough to outshine the stars, and as they strode through the sky, I could feel the gods above them grinning down in violent pride. Then clashes and booms and roars started coming from up ahead. The giants were wading into a scrap. It was hard to see what was going on, given I was looking up from between the flanks of the galloping squigoths. But it was a big, big, big fight. It kept getting bigger, and I think the orcs won. Surely they couldn't have lost. But then, when the noises of the fight faded away, the presence of the gods did too. It was like the whole cavern got cold and dark again, like it had been to start with. The squigoth stopped in their tracks, and so did every other thing in the whole of the great green. It was like everything was lost. Suddenly, looking around and wondering what to do now, of course, they started fighting. It was a frenzy above and below, from the giants trading punches like comet strikes in the sky, to the snotlings wrapping skinny claws around each other's necks down below, and with no gods to bang everyone's heads together and tell them to pack it in, it went on until the whole place was like a butcher's tent, and there had been enough murders for the survivors to have some space. It weren't peaceful then, but it weren't a bloodbath neither. Cause all the really hard things, like the orcs in the sky, were dead. And it went on for ages like that. There were orcs still, but they were nothing like the colossal fighters who had been there before. And they were all stuck down on the cavern floor. Watching them was a bit like watching raindrops get swiped away by a truck's hatch wipers. Every time one got big enough to seem like it might make it up to the sky, all the others nearby ganged up and beat it into shreds. So none of them got as big as they should have been. Until one did, that is. It wasn't even that big when it got attacked, but it promptly demolished every orc that came at it, delivering headbutts like point-blank cannon strikes and pulling any survivors in the line to fight alongside it. As more and more enemies flooded in, the fight got larger, and so did the pile of bodies in front of it. Green lightning started to strike all around it, and soon that body pile reached all the way to the sky. Seeing this, the new giant began climbing the mountain of the dead towards the stars. With every step, the winner grew more bulky, more vigorous. And soon, the cavern started glowing bright again. The stars swelled. I knew that Gork and Mork was back, somehow. Or that they'd never been gone. But it just lost interest for a while. Until there'd been something worth looking at again. Soon, 
the champion reached the top of the buddy pile, where the stars had grown so big, there was no black left between them, and it stood there for a moment, like it was thinking, looking up at that titan, which had horns now, as well as loads of arms bearing all sorts of different guns and choppers. I was terrified, but I also knew what joy was for the first time. And then the Titan looked back down at me. There were spaceships flitting across the green sea of its one good eye, looking like tiny bingots. And as the full weight of the glare bore down on me, I thanked the gods that they'd let me die like this. But the giant didn't kill me. It curled a finger big enough to flick a moon into a planet and it beckoned me, and it turned and stepped into glorious infinite green, leaving only flames in its boot prints. Moments after the shared vision, Gazgul grabbed a hold of the grot, declaring his name to be Makari, and that he would accompany Gazgul as his banner waver. He then set the grot to painting a banner of the monstrous, multi-limbed orc so that all would see Gazgul's destiny and tremble. Gazgul knew what he had to do. The gods had tasked him with unifying the orc species into a great unstoppable war. And he was going to start with this planet right here, Urk. It is impossible to overestimate this enemy. The newly born prophet set about his holy mission almost immediately. Approaching Dregmech, the Death Skull warlord who ruled Rustbike, Gazgul launched into a tirade insulting Dregmech, calling the larger heavily armored orc a disgrace who had forgotten the will of the gods and spent his days scrabbling for human scraps and pointlessly fighting other orcs but conquering nothing. With his bodyguard of orc knobs watching on, the warboss could hardly put up with these insults. So he opened fire with his multi-barreled custom big shooter. The rapid fire weapon shredding just about everything around Gazgul. But whether due to shoddy orc weaponry, the will of the gods, the sheer will of Gazgul himself, or just the crappy job Grotznik had done replacing Dregmet's eye. Not one round found its target. Once the weapon clicked dry, the Prophet systematically wore down and battered the larger orc to death in front of the other high-ranked Death Skull orcs. The most prominent of which, a tall orc called Bullets, approached the young Gazgull who offered to fight Bullets also. The knob considered it, but felt sure he would be in for way bigger and better fights if he followed him instead. Declaring that Gazgul now ruled Rustbike, and any that took issue with it could answer to him. Knowing this town was just the beginning, Gazgul was happy to let bullets take charge of the Death Skulls. As each of the clans would need bosses to lead them, unified under the Prophet. For now, it was just one, but in time he would build himself a council, a council of clan bosses. The Prophet instituted a series of new rules in Rustbike, outlawing fights between work gangs while they worked. They could still fight, of course, but not while on shift. This revolutionary concept meant Rustbike got rich at an astounding rate, drawing interest and attention from the nearby clans. This caused Gazgul to institute Da Big Rule, another sweeping reform, allowing members of any clan to join Rustspike so long as they served Gazgul. It was during this time he first began to suffer from frequent migraines, but each one was followed by a burst of inspiration. The Orc concluded it was the gods speaking to him. Gazgul knew if he was going to truly unify Urk, it would take more than just killing all the other bosses. He would need to make statements that no orc could ignore. 
prove who had the favor of the gods. He would beat them at their own games. First was the Cult of Speed. Gasgol took a single, rusted, barely functional warbike to Evil Sun's territory to challenge their speed boss, an orc called Shazfrag, to a race. Known as the best driver on Urk and facing pitiful opposition, Shazfrag accepted. Such was the power of the Prophet's faith. His old bike kept the speed boss neck and neck the entire race, prompting the other orc to begin shooting at Gazgol. Several accounts of what happened next exist. But we do know a bolt was thrown from Gazgal's bike, either by Gazgal himself or his Grot Banner Waver, that somehow managed to jam Shazfrag's shooter, causing it to explode in his hand, sending the Speed Freak off course into a rocky outcropping of the canyon they raced in. Speeding past the fireball of Shazfrag's bike, Gazgal won. And what was more, the speed boss had survived and was so impressed, he declared for the profit on the spot, bringing the largest band of speed freaks on the planet under his command with him. The Council of Clan Bosses had its second member. Next, Gazgal took his mechanized force into the desert held by the Bad Moon Clan. Here he would challenge their warlord Snazdaka to a sea battle, and offer the orc who called himself Da Mega Admiral couldn't refuse. There are few verifiable details about this battle, but we do know Gazgul shattered Snazdaka's fleet on a dusty plain. Letting the Admiral live, the Prophet had absorbed another clan and added another member to his council. Not to mention, Snazdaka's mighty power weapon, Gork's Claw, became Gazgul's. From here, Gazgul sought the loyalty of the Snakebite Beastmasters. So he journeyed to their monster-infested swamps to challenge the ancient and famously stubborn Boss Grudbolg. Once again, letting his enemy set terms. Gazgul found himself in a knife fight. It didn't matter, of course. The orcs who followed the Prophet had seen him do the impossible again and again. They knew he wouldn't lose, and they were right. Gazgul beheaded the snakebite warboss. But never one to waste a good warlord, the Prophet held the head to its neck till the wound had healed over again, at which point Gazgul offered Grudbolg the chance to join. He refused. So Gazgul beheaded him again and repeated the process. Again, he refused. So Gazgul fought the older orc again and beheaded and reheaded him for a third time, at which point, finally, Grudbol got the message and swore the snake bites to the Prophet, joining on as the next member of the Council of Clan Bosses. Always cunning, the Blood Axe clan was quick to see the way the winds were blowing, and didn't wait for Gazgul to come to them. Their leader, the illustrious General Stratagem, snuck into Gazgul's Rust Spike Fortress, getting so close he could have touched the Prophet if he wished. But it was simply to show he could. The General gladly swore loyalty to Gazgul. The final warlord standing between Gazgul and total dominance of the planet Urk was the boss of Gazgul's own birth clan, the Goths. Ugrak. For the longest time, Ugrak had been the largest orc on Urk, but with each victory, Gazgul had grown exponentially. So when Ugrak had brought his entire horde to Rustpike to finally see what all the fuss was about, the Prophet towered over him. Still, Ugrak was undeterred. A traditional goth, the war boss had only brought his army with him to watch. He would face this upstart in perhaps the oldest contest to exist among orc kind. 
a sacred ritual that honoured both Gork and Mork, as it was a battle of minds as much as it was a battle of bodies. The war boss and the prophet would engage in a contest of headbutts. As you can imagine, Gazgul with his skull made of Terminator armour was the victor. And though his eyes would never look in the same direction at the same time again, Ugrak survived. And once he regained consciousness, the Goth swore loyalty to the hardest hitter he had ever encountered. And the Council of Clan Bosses was complete. Gazgul had defeated his rivals and unified Urk. With the easy part done, he needed to find a way for his fledgling Wa to survive the local sun going supernova. And time was not on his side. 